Hello, hello again. Hello and welcome again. Delia Smith has reigned supreme for four decades as the queen of TV cookery. It is with great excitement and full moistness that we give you Delia Smith. Delia, well, the recipe Delia, we're going Delia, to do... Delia. Sparkle! No one has done more to shape the way we cook and the way we eat, and never more so than in the 90s, the decade of the Delia effect, when the merest hint of a new ingredient or utensil caused a riot. They caught this as the taste of winter cranberry. <laughs> the decade where Christmas came early, followed by a best-selling summer and winter. Well, here's a little selection from the winter collection. And Delia will be revisiting her seasonal favourites, chicken basque, chocolate bread and butter pudding and a dinner party classic, Piedmont peppers. How can anything so simple and easy to make taste so wonderful? the decade when girl power bounced in and the Iron Lady was bounced out. Cool Britannia ruled the airwaves and Oasis were sorted. It was the decade of Sonic the Hedgehog and Dolly the Sheep. Baywatch surfed the beach and we all started to surf the net because the 90s was all about information technology. IT meant chips with everything. Delia Smith started the 90s by going home for Christmas. In this series, I'm very pleased to be able to invite you all into my own home here in Suffolk to share in all the busy preparations that lead up to Christmas Day. We put a television kitchen set into the conservatory, but it meant I was really at home. If you've forgotten to get a Christmas cake, even from the supermarket, you can make this on Christmas Eve and it'll take you about two minutes in all. And, Six you know... What I wanted was to, to, for it to look like real life. So, you know, you had the wind blowing the trees and the birds and we had squirrels and whatever. And so it just looked real rather than being in a dead studio. And in the next 30 minutes, what I hope to do is take you through the last 36 hours. The series was a complete countdown to Christmas. It started in October and ended with the Queen's speech and the fight over the washing up. It was Delia's version of an advent calendar, but instead of finding a chocolate, you got a recipe for chocolate log. And she's still opening it now. I take it out, you know, in October and put it away in January, and I still personally find it very, very helpful. You know, there, there is a bit in the book that tells you, you know, what to do in the last 36 hours of Christmas. I still have to look it up. Like a lot of Delia's books, it became law in many households. Stuffy, do you think I'd be mad to try Delia's exotic cranberry one? No, no, that'd be lovely. Not all of them grateful. I mean, there's a scene in The Vicar of Dibley where Dawn curses Delia Smith because of how many of her Christmas recipes she's had. More sprouts, Vicar. <laughs> If I ever actually meet Delia Smith in person, I'm afraid I'm going to have to stuff cranberries into every available orifice. Well, it beats writing a letter to points of view. <laughs> Delia's recipes do occasionally come in for criticism, and when someone complains, she takes it to heart. The roast turkey cooking times are just not enough. This recipe has been followed by myself and my mother and my sister-in-law. The result for all of us was raw mm. turkey. Right, that sounds like a challenge. When somebody comes up to me and says, I've cooked something and it's wonderful, that is me aglow with achievement, you know? But when somebody says it isn't, that I always have it retested, always do it again, always check it. But what I've learned over the years is the difference between ovens. Because my Christmas cake recipe, I get letters from people saying it's burnt, and I get letters from people saying it's raw. So you, what you're dealing with out there is a lot of different ovens and a lot of different ways people cook. I also have complaints from people about recipes that I've never, ever done. In this test, Delia and her assistant Lindsay have prepared two identical turkeys. One will go in her domestic oven... ..to just... ..and one in the prep kitchen, 
They are cooked for the exact time stated in the recipe and removed at the same time. The result is, well, were you really expecting anything different? Two perfectly cooked turkeys. Well, Christmas time is party time. The Christmas program was to bring an unexpected present for one ingredient manufacturer. It was the start of a marketing phenomenon that became known as the Delia Effect. It came to my attention when I was eating this beautiful chocolate dessert in a London restaurant. And the chef who invented the dessert came out and had a chat. And I just said, that was unbelievable. It was so good. How did you make it? He said, well, I'll give you the recipe. This is what I call a chocolate stunner. It's called chocolate truffle tort. And it's so good, I want to show you just how to make it. And then there's a new ingredient that goes in next, something you might not have seen before, and that is liquid glucose. Now, you buy liquid glucose at the chemist shop, and I've got five tablespoons of it here, which I'm going to put in. And if you listen very carefully, you can hear the sound of manufacturers of a certain ingredient doing the conga. And people were, you know, rushing into chemists, and they, they all sold out of liquid glucose. I found out after Christmas, if I'd only known I could have said it on the programme, that vets always have liquid glucose as well. So you could have got it at the local vet. Still, sales of glucose were up by 200%, and it wasn't long before supermarkets caught on and started stocking it routinely. The success of the Christmas series and book proved that Christmas didn't have to come just once a year. People bought it all year round. It started Delia thinking about other seasonal recipes. Because Christmas worked so well, and I'm sort of really, really into seasons, you know, all my cookery career, I've always tried to, you know, um, guide people into seasons. And I thought, what a lovely way to do it. And again, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have a cookery book that's just for summer? And um, I just wanted to have a go at it and do it. The BBC planned a front cover for the book that would feature Delia and reflect the very best of the British summer. That was their first mistake. I sat sort of on, a tape behind, on the blue crushed velvet on the background and the garden truck of vegetables, and there was my little face, you know, peeping over the top. <laughs> I just knew, I just knew it wasn't going to work. It just wasn't going to work. Especially as they'd angled the asparagus in a, in a really very difficult way. <laughs> and uh, it was, you know, the tips of the asparagus were about an inch from my mouth and it didn't look <laughs> uh, quite right. So Delia had to come up with another idea. I said, no, I can't do it. I want something that, you know, says summer. I used to walk into a bookshop in London and they had a cookery book table in there. And I used to look at these cookery books and they all kind of blended into each other and they all looked the same. And I thought, well, how am I going to reach people in amongst all that lot? So I thought about the sunflower and saw, wow, yeah, that is really different. That looks different. The summer collection was an instant hit. Here at my home in Suffolk over the next few weeks, what I want to offer you is a whole collection of sunny summer recipes, so that even if the good old British weather isn't all it should be, we can still enjoy together the wonder and colour of summer produce. Its success created instant demands for the key ingredients. Limes, coriander, fresh ginger and lemongrass started popping up at picnics everywhere. How clever doing all this. It's not all me, the salads are Delia Smith's. Does she know you've got them? <laughs> One of the recipes, Piedmont peppers, became an instant classic and star of the dinner party circuit. And she still enjoys making it today at her home in Suffolk. I'm about to take you and me on a trip down memory lane because the recipe I'm going to show you is called Piemonte peppers. First of all, you've got to halve the peppers and you put it down, get a knife and, and make a slit and then turn it right ways up so that what you've got at the end is the stalks. You're not going to eat them, but they're just there because they just look nicer and they stay firmer. Then you're just going to cut out the seeds 
and spread them out onto an oil baking tray. Now I'm going to put the filling in. I've got here six tomatoes that have already been skinned and I'm going to cut the tomatoes into quarters. Put three quarters into each pepper. Next thing I'm going to do is use these, which are anchovy fillets, and just snip one fillet into each pepper. When we did it on the television, it did take people by storm. Everybody was making it and serving it. People were saying, oh gosh, if I go out and have one more lot of Piemonte peppers, I'll die because I've had three this week, somebody said. That's how popular it was. Now we've got slices of garlic. They're going in now. Next we need some olive oil, about a dessert spoon on each one. The next thing we're going to do is add seasoning. They're going to take about an hour to cook, but sometimes I leave them a bit extra because I like to have the edges really nice and toasted. I'm not putting salt in because there's plenty of salt in the anchovies, so they're going to go into the oven now. When the peppers are cooked, it's best to remove them from the oven and let them cool down. You can serve them hot if you want to, some people prefer that, but I think they're better room temperature, sort of like a salad-y starter. And um, all you do then is just transfer them to a plate. You can make them the day before if you keep them cool, but don't put them in the fridge. They shouldn't go in the fridge, it sort of robs them of something. We're going to be generous today and give two per person as a first course. And what that now needs is a little bit of the juices spooned over, which you can divide between them all. Lovely juices with all those lovely garlicky tomato flavours. And then finally, a little bit more Italian here, and put a sprig of basil on each one before it goes to the table. And I'm going to say what I said last time, because I remember what I said last time. How can anything so simple and easy to make taste so wonderful? The summer collection was a huge success, staying in the top ten bestsellers list for more than two years. Delia was awarded an OBE, and having achieved the status of national treasure, she now felt ready to come out. She finally revealed the secret passion she shares with her husband, Michael, and me. Calm down. We all support Norwich City. One day, we got a phone call from somebody who said, we're looking for people to invest in the football club. You know, would you just come and have dinner with us so we can explain it to you? And they, they said, if you could give us a loan, quite a substantial loan... Um, we would give you both a place on the board. We both felt that um, we didn't want to do anything else with our money. The only thing that really we wanted in life was the success of our football club. So we thought, right, let's get in there and see if there's anything we can do. She couldn't exactly pull on a pair of boots and stick one in, but she could offer her expertise in food. It was a recipe for success for the catering side of the club. On order, two curry, one fish. Over the years, Delia and Michael have ploughed £11 million of their own money into their beloved club. It may not have bought success on the pitch at the highest level, but it buys you a lovely prawn cocktail. This is, I don't know which book this is in, I think it's in How to Cook, but it's marinated chicken, um, it's sort of a Caribbean marinade, and it's got a mango salsa that goes with it, and saffron rice and, and salad. God, I could murder that now, could you? The catering side of Norwich City is thriving and leagues ahead of most other football clubs. We have been voted the third best catering in a football club in Europe. Number one was Barcelona, number two was Arsenal, and we were number three. Are you listening, Man U and Chelsea? Gaze upon our jambalaya and tremble. And as for our chicken, Basque, it's a match winner. Delia thinks so too, and that's why she selected this dish as a personal favourite from the 90s. What I'm 
doing here in my cooking pot is I'm browning chicken. It's a chicken that's been jointed into eight pieces. Now, the important thing is, first of all, is to brown the chicken nicely, and you can see that that's got a lovely golden skin, and it's worth spending a bit of time getting the chicken really nice and golden brown, because that's going to help the flavour. Now, what I'm doing now is adding onions to the pan and keeping the heat high. Everything is cooked in one pot, and you can just sit at the table and serve it out, and that's all you have to do. And that's one of my philosophies about cooking, and that is that what you want to do is enjoy the people as well as the food, and this allows you to do that. It leaves you free. So there we've got it now, nice and sort of charred at the edges, because that gives flavour. Next, I've got chorizo sausage. Um, the thing about the book Summer Collection was it was all to do with sunshine and Mediterranean flavours. So I'm just going to stir that around a bit. And then one of the other ingredients that was sort of all the rage was sun-dried tomatoes. And people have forgotten them a little bit now, but they're still a very good ingredient. Handful of those. Chopped garlic. We're now going to add rice. And this is basmati rice, but it's not white basmati rice, it's brown. So we're going to stir that around a bit now. Just get the rice just sort of glistening with oil. And then here I've got sun-dried tomato paste, which is going to enrich the sauce. Tablespoon of that. And then I've got paprika, just a teaspoonful. And then just a little bit of herbs. I'm using thyme today. I've got a teaspoonful of thyme. Now it's going to need liquid, so chicken stock next. And then some white wine. And I've got Spanish white wine here just to keep the Mediterranean thing going. Some freshly milled pepper and some salt. Then once the stock and the wine is up to simmering point, we're going to return the chicken joints to the pan. And then there's two more ingredients to go. Now we're going to add a bit more colour, even though it's already very colourful, and that's some wedges of orange, which not only give it um, colour, but obviously you get that lovely, um, fragrant, citrusy flavour. And then lastly, the great Mediterranean ingredient, which is olives, and I'm using tiny little olives. Now the heat comes down to just barely simmer with a lid on for 50 to 55 minutes, or if you want to, you can put it in the oven, a medium oven, and you can cook it for the same time. The great thing about this recipe is that you didn't need to serve anything with it. That's why it was so popular, because it's a complete meal all by itself. The 1990s saw the rise of a TV phenomenon that in some ways Delia was responsible for. This was the decade in which television really discovered and exploited the cookery show. Mum's little baby like shortening, shortening. Mum's little baby like shortening bread. <laughs> we hit the 90s and that's when the celebrity chef was born. But I think all of that, of course, was also born from Delia. You know, it was that great tutoring of old, but now all of a sudden you've got a lot of these young personalities, these good-looking chaps, you know, with funny hairdos and uh, odd clothes and funny coloured chef's trousers and everything else, many of them still wearing those same clothes. Who could he be talking about? What we're creating here is textures. And now, rattling plates in all directions. I really think the explosion of TV chefs was that, that suddenly the... TV companies, um, A, realised here was a wonderful source of very cheap television making. None of us got paid that much in those days. But B, it was eminently watchable. But we're going to plunk this straight in there now. Because of all the TV cooking now, it has in some ways become very chefy. And what chefs do in restaurants is not what you do at home. And sometimes you can't cross the line, you know? And we all need wonderful chefs, and I have great regard for wonderful chefs, and I want to go and eat in restaurants, and I want to celebrate birthdays and have very special things. But I do think sometimes it doesn't reach out to the ordinary person who's got to get a meal on the table when they get home every night. Bob, you put another plate out, love. Tricky's here. Right!
With all the new cooks taking centre stage, Delia took the opportunity of going behind the scenes to learn about the origins of ingredients. It became something of a pilgrimage. One of the things that was always difficult was getting ingredients to people and trying to persuade um, delis and supermarkets to stock the right ingredients. And then I got a call one day saying, would I be a consultant for a leading supermarket? And it was, wow, yes, I might have some influence in what people can actually buy. So the idea was, let's publish a magazine so that people can read about ingredients, understand what they are and how to use them. And that was my passion. And so therefore, being married to an editor seemed to be, well, come on, Michael, could you do a magazine, please? Is that oh, right? You, yes, yes, you persuaded me in the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they took you to Canada. Uh, Canada to, was maple syrup. Yeah, Tokyo. Yeah. For soy sauce. It took us all over the world. It was absolutely fantastic. And the importance of ingredients was to be proved beyond any doubt when Delia launched her next book and series, The Winter Collection. The last time I welcomed you into my garden, we were anticipating the beginnings of a summer full of cooking. But this time, as you can see, the year has moved on. This introduced one ingredient that created such a run on the market, it made the news. And if limes were flavour of summer, I can tell you, cranberries are definitely the flavour of this series. Yeah. Still, it could do with some cranberries. Yes, cranberries, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new thing, new fangled thing from court. Court? Oh, yes, in court, they say it's the taste of winter cranberries. Yeah. <laughs> No, urine is the taste of winter. Always has been, always will be. Yes. It's OK, they're taking the mickey. It was actually cranberries. And the recipe we're going to make today is spiced, sautéed red cabbage with cranberries. I wanted people to understand this wonderful fruit and how brilliant it was and how, you know, it was underused. It was only used for cranberry sauce for turkey. And so, you know... <laughs> Everybody went out and bought the cranberries. And, of course, the people in New England, they couldn't understand, you know, why this sudden British rush on cranberries. And, you know, I was presented with a trophy, which was a cranberry scoop engraved, you know, and a little jug. Uh, thank you from the American people of New England for what you did to cranberries, you know. Luckily, Delia's head wasn't turned by all that Yankee glitz and glamour. She was still coming up with good old British dishes like chocolate bread and butter pudding. We in Britain are very, very good at making proper puddings. This was an old favourite with a new twist. Place a bowl over a saucepan of barely simmering water. Add dark 70% chocolate, sugar, butter and whipping cream. Then also add some rum and cinnamon. Let this all melt over a gentle heat until it becomes completely smooth and glossy. Next, whisk three eggs and add the chocolate sauce, mixing it all really thoroughly. Then line the dish with overlapping slices of bread, crust removed and cut into triangles. Ladle some chocolate sauce over the bread and use a fork to press the bread down so that it's covered evenly. Then repeat the whole thing using all the sauce. When cool, cover with cling film and place in the fridge for at least 24 hours or even better, 48. Bake on a high shelf in the oven for 30 to 35 minutes. The top should be crunchy and the inside soft and squidgy. I like to leave it to stand for 10 minutes before serving with lashings of chilled pouring cream. Delia's winter collection had become an all-time record-breaking bestseller and important people had noticed. We always try and get the most successful people in their fields to work with us. We're, we're not miniaturists, so if we can have the Spice Girls, we'll go for the Spice Girls. And uh, Delia was, I think, the most successful author in the country at that point, without any doubt. They wanted me to do some little television cookery clips for Comic Relief, 
accompanied by recipes and they'll put the recipes in a little booklet and sell them. So we suggest that we could sell it for a pound, we can give 62p away to the charity. She was having none of it. Uh, she got in touch with her suppliers, with all the people she worked with, with her photographers, and said, we're just all going to do it for free. Hello and welcome to the Red Nose Recipe Collection, 12 stunning new recipes that only take five minutes to prepare. A foxy-looking dealia in red lipstick had a variety of celebrity helpers, some more helpful than others. Hello, Your Highness. <laughs> well, I'm going to make a very special recipe for you, Dawn. This is called chocolate button mini muffins. You put yeah. a red nose on the top in yeah. the shape of a whole cherry. Yeah. Do you like the sound of that? Oh, I think it sounds absolutely lovely. I mean, I can't tell you the retakes that we had to do because she was so funny. Do you know, I think I'd better just check that, actually. <laughs> what do you mean, check it? You know, taste it. Well, it's raw, it's not cooked. Yeah, but I think I ought to, at this point. All right, then. OK. <laughs> and then you take the spoon again and you just gently fold the chocolate buttons into the mixture. She just kept taking the chocolate and it was all over her face and every time I looked at her, I just couldn't stop laughing. Would you like to carry on now? Right, yep. One teaspoon One. into each tin, for the like tin. that. One for me. She had to faint. I think, at the mention of Eric Cantona and her thighs. By the way, did you know that uh, Eric Cantona has expressed a wish to lick you up the legs? <laughs> I think I did that rather well. Well, she taught me how to do it. I had to, you know, I had to practice and she taught me how to do it. We sold a million copies and a million pounds went to charity. <laughs> This meant an appearance on Comic Relief Night with a big cheque and a big surprise. I thought I was going on the stage to present the cheque. Now, don't be scared, Dealey. Nothing terrible is going to happen. It's all going to be fantastic. You sure? And rather than just having her come on and give over a cheque and say, hooray, wasn't it great, we got Lenny as Theophilus de Wildebeest yeah. to seduce her on a bed of lettuce. Let's get cosy in these leaves. Me with it collapsed. And I'm, I still don't know to this day whether it was supposed to or whether it was an accident. But anyway, it was live television and it did. Eat me like the salad I am. Come on, Delia. I thought it was risky. We thought she might turn. Yeah. But she didn't. She giggled. Delia, I wrote a poem for you, girl. It goes like this. Listen to this poem. Delia, Delia, please have my babies. I got turned down by the two fat ladies. <laughs> Working with those wonderfully talented people, what you realise is they are natural comedians, you know, and they're funny even when you're not filming. You know, they're just great. Next week, it's the noughties when we'll be bringing the Delia story bang up to date. It was back to basics and beyond with how to cook and how to cheat. You can use frozen chopped onion... The reaction was phenomenal. If I'd lived in medieval times, I'd have been burnt at the stake without any doubt whatsoever. She'll be making one of her all-time favourite recipes. A fluffy melted cheese omelette. And we'll be finding out how to make fast roast chicken and shami kebabs. Well, now we really have run out of time, but I'm going to be back next week, and I hope you'll be back too. You can find the series so far of Delia Through the Decades on BBC iPlayer. Next on BBC Two, children, how they've come to dominate the British family. Food for Thought with Kirsty Young in a moment.